This is day 15 of reading Revelation. Then one of the seven angels who were holding the seven bowls came and said to me, Come here, I will show you the judgment on the great harlot who lives, lives near the many waters. The kings of the earth have had intercourse with her, and the inhabitants of the earth became drunk on the wine of her harlotry. Then he carried me away in spirit to a deserted place, where I saw a woman seated on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names, with seven heads and ten horns. The woman was wearing purple and scarlet and adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held in her hand a gold cup that was filled with the abominable and sordid deeds of her harlotry. On her forehead was written a name, which is a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk on the blood of the holy ones and on the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly amazed. The angel said to me, Why are you amazed? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw existed once, but now exists no longer. It will come up from the abyss and is headed for destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, shall be amazed when they see the beast, because it existed once, but exists no longer, and yet it will come again. Here is a clue for one who has wisdom. The seven heads represent seven hills upon which the woman sits. They also represent seven kings. Five have already fallen, one still lives, and the last has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain only a short while. The beast that existed once but exists no longer is an eighth king, but really belongs to the seven and is headed for destruction. The ten horns that you saw represent ten kings who have not yet been crowned. They will receive royal authority along with the beast for one hour. They are of one mind and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will fight with the Lamb, but the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. Then he said to me, The waters that you saw where the, the harlot lives represent large numbers of peoples, nations, and tongues. The ten horns that you saw and the beast will hate the harlot. They will leave her desolate and naked. They will eat her flesh and consume her with fire. For God has put it into their minds to carry out his purpose and to make them come to an agreement to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are accomplished. The woman whom you saw represents the great city that has sovereignty over the kings of the earth. Carrying on from yesterday with my theme of sounding like a broken record, my first and probably most important comment for today is that extra caution is needed when reading a passage like the one that we just heard. There's good reason for technical caution because, although it may not have been apparent, or maybe it has been apparent to you, the story in Revelation doesn't necessarily have any standard understanding of continuity. Images can shift when a character that's referred to in one way may not be the same character later who's nonetheless given the same name. The author isn't really trying to write a novel in which the characters have story arcs. These are a series of images that are in some ways connected, certainly overall in terms of the, the his or her overall purpose in writing, uh, but not in any ordinary sense as if we're being told a story from beginning to end where everything makes sense. And there's also a good spiritual reason not to be too crazy in the way we read this, because there's an even higher than normal temptation to read into what we see here, who the kings are, why this king is referred to as being part of that king, which kings came already and which ones have yet to be, exactly who the harlot is and you know, who that represents or what that represents and how that fits neatly with the vision of the world that we would like to see. So be careful. Don't read anything too literal or even vaguely literal into some of these images. But I want to suggest a few things that may possibly be 
safe inferences from what we hear. Note that the harlot is expensively dressed. This is the beginning of the writer of Revelation's main critique of economic power and exploitation. She's linked to Babylon, which is used as a symbol of worldly wealth all the way through and worldly power all the way through. And so the fact that the harlot is showing off in the decorations that she, she has on that this person, whatever this, this being is supposed to be, we're being told something negative about worldly wealth and the way that worldly wealth is accumulated and preserved. Clearly, this is a negative image. This is not a figure that we're supposed to want to be. And in that is some suggestion of how the followers of Jesus should behave, how we should view worldly wealth and the tactics that are used in the acquisition, management, preservation, bequeathing, everything else we can imagine in, in terms of worldly wealth. Clearly, that's not who the followers of Jesus are supposed to be. Conveniently, it seems that's not who the followers of Jesus were at the time that the writer of Revelation was writing. But that doesn't change the fact that you and I are also being told something about wealth in our own context and by our own standards. All the kings and the confusion about their roles and their tenure should also make us a little skeptical of worldly power. You may recall, I'm, I'm old enough to remember a time in the 1960s and 70s and 80s when a leader of the Soviet Union would die and then there was a period of speculation about who would succeed him because what went on in the Kremlin was secretive and was carefully shielded from outside, full outside scrutiny. We're told something in that about the nature of power and the way that the worldly power can be confusing. But we should always remember that it cannot save us. Whatever it may be able to do, however, it much, however much it may be able to influence our lives, however much pain and suffering it may be able to bring into the world in the form of, of war and unjust rule, it cannot save us. All that the power of this world can ever do is bring death. It is only God and God's kingdom that ultimately can bring life. Note that by the end of this passage, the worldly powers are turning on one another. This also is a message about what the end of worldly power will be. Its goal is never the life that God intends, and as a consequence, ultimately, it has the seeds of its own destruction planted in it before it even begins. Finally, and something that's, that's worth noting is absent from this scene, is any mention of the faithful. There are no crowds of the saints, no crowds of martyrs, no crowds of those who have won the victory and the white robe and all the other images and, and phrases that the, the writer of Revelation uses. It could be seen as a call to hermeticism of some sort, to withdraw from the world, to have nothing to do with worldly power. There certainly are Christian groups, the members of which do not vote or serve in the military or take oaths or serve on juries or serve in public office in any way. And that is partly, I think, a reading, a result of their reading of Revelation and other places in the Bible that calls Christians to maintain an appropriate distance from the powers of this world. I would suggest, though, that since most of us must live in the world, if not necessarily be of the world, there's something here about viewing honesty and viewing honestly and without illusions the structures and institutions of this world. That what we may put our faith in, in terms of governments and boundaries and nation states and the way that we defend ourselves against those people in that other country, uh, are truly only illusions and only temporary. And cannot in the end prevent our worst impulses from leading us to turn on one another in worldly ways if that is the main guide for what we do with our lives. 
And for those of us who have positions of leadership in the church, for those who care about the organization of the church, there's also a warning here about the models of church organization. When churches appear to become too imperial or too democratic for that matter or too anything, when they come to model human institution and institutions and human understandings of power and authority rather than godly understandings of those things, the church also runs the risk of becoming a worldly institution and falling away from its true mission. <laughs> Oh, yeah.